Hi, Dr. Gutsman. Thanks for joining the program. Happy to be here. So I'm excited to have you on. This is the fourth episode of uh, a new segment that we're doing, the Liberty Lounge. In the first two episodes of the Liberty Lounge, I did an in-depth review of Thomas G. West's book, um, The Political Theory of the American Founding. And I used that book to sort of examine the, the Lockean character of um, our Constitution and the, and the Founders' philosophy. I also looked at the ways in which different state constitutions uh, influence the drafting of um, our uh, nation's constitution. Uh, and in episode three, I did a, an in-depth review of Jonah Goldberg's book, Suicide of the West. And then we actually had Tom Woods on. I know you've done a book with Tom Woods. Um, so this is a special edition of the Liberty Lounge. And I want to start by telling listeners how I learned about you Um Dr. Gutsman. So this was about a year ago, and um, Dave Rubin from the Rubin Report was doing this uh, series on the uh, U.S. presidents in uh, conjunction with Learn Liberty, and you were on there talking about James Madison, and you were great uh, on the program, and I, I learned a lot, actually. Um, I didn't know who you were at the time, uh, and then I looked you up, and you've got an impressive uh, body of work. You wrote a book on James Madison, James Madison and the Making of America. You wrote The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution, and you recently wrote a book uh, about Thomas Jefferson that I thought was well-reviewed, um, and I'm enjoying that book. I'm, I'm not quite done with it yet. So you're the perfect guest to have on for the Liberty Lounge, and I want to start with your most recent book, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Revolutionary, A Radical's Struggle to Remake America. You start the, the book by saying, quote, Thomas Jefferson's influence on American history outstrips that of any other figure. Uh, and you say, quote, uh, the marks of his statesmanship are with us all over America every day. How so, uh, Professor Gutsman? Oh, boy. Well, uh, one example is that, just a small example, Jefferson is the fellow who came up with the idea of having a decimal coinage system. And the United States were the first country to have a decimal coinage system. Eventually, other countries would adopt the same idea, including in my own memory, even finally the United Kingdom did. So this is one thing every day about Jefferson that still affects us. Another is Jefferson is the fellow who had the idea that American public architecture should be based on Greek and Roman models. And before he came along, that was not the case. Now, three quarters of the states have state capitals that are similar to the U.S. Capitol, which also was conceived in part by Jefferson. He's the fellow who also had the idea that there should be grand boulevards and a very interesting, elaborate um, design for the federal capital, Washington, D.C. The universities that dot the landscape in the United States are all Jeffersonian. So people, if they know anything about Thomas Jefferson, have probably heard that he's the father of the University of Virginia. And you think, well, okay, so Alaska has a university, Florida has a university, Virginia has a university, big deal. But actually, before the University of Virginia, the way that schooling worked, whether you were in Italy or Germany or Scotland or Georgia was that you'd be assigned particular two or three pages of material and then when you showed up to class uh, you'd be called on and you'd stand next to your desk and recite what you had been told to memorize. And Jefferson had the idea, well th this doesn't really leave any space for learning anything. How about if we had essay examinations? And in fact, there's an interesting correspondence between Jefferson and a fellow he knew who was a professor at Harvard College at the time about this idea of essay examinations. And the Harvard professor really loved the idea. And so eventually he wrote Jefferson again and said, well, I brought this idea up at the most recent meeting of the faculty of Harvard College. And the vote was one in favor and all the rest against. And the outcome of this was that Harvard didn't have uh, essay examinations until the 1840s. So nowadays we take for granted that um, students won't be given just reams of material to memorize. Also we take for granted that college curricula are not based on the Greek and Latin languages. 
that people have elective courses. In fact, Jefferson's um, draft of a bill for the more general diffusion of, diffusion of knowledge also contemplated females being schooled. You can go on and on. So really what it amounts to is that every university, with a couple of exceptions, every university in America is a little University of Virginia. And <laughs> people don't realize how significant the University of Virginia is in American educational history. So there's another example. There are many other ways, too. It's it, Take the geographic extent of the United States, of course. When he was president of the United States, Jefferson was responsible for the Louisiana Purchase, which more than doubled the size of the United States. It, it essentially cemented the reality that the United States were going to be a great power, a transcontinental country, and we don't even think about that. So there are many other ways, too. These are just a few that come immediately to mind. It's really astounding the number of areas of everyday life that Jefferson's mark rests on today. Absolutely. So in the book, you say, quote, uh, much of American political history since his day concerns, concerns the ways and extent to which Americans should understand Jefferson's creed as our common creed. Um, now, I get your point there, obviously, that Jefferson, really, his philosophy defines the American um, spirit, the American character. Um, and this was probably true. You might even argue you could say this about the, the average American up until the, you know, the, the 1980s or 1990s. Uh, I mean, uh, you did have the progressive movement with Woodrow Wilson and FDR, uh, you know, but you also had Barry Goldwater and Reagan and the conservative movement, and you had a kind of resurgence of interest in the founding creed. Um, but increasingly, it seems, and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, that the Jefferson American political creed of constitutional republicanism, ordered liberty, uh, the idea that the purpose of the government is to protect natural rights, right, uh, limited government, federalism, individualism. It seems to me like Jefferson's philosophy is no longer the American creed. It it saddens me. Uh, not I can admit that we are still the out and out the freest nation in the history of the world. Uh, still to this day, we have the best protections on free speech and um, you know and all of this. Uh, but uh, am I wrong about this? This the sense that. Uh, we no longer um, hold in our hearts the sort of Jeffersonian, um, almost libertarianism that, that we once did. Ah, well, certainly is a, a way of thinking about the world that's beset. Uh, you mentioned discussion with uh, Professor West about uh, America's founding creed, and he actually is one who who's on the nationalist end of this uh, spectrum, so not a supporter of the Jeffersonian theory of uh, decentralized government and authority ultimately in the states and it, within the states and local communities. So um, it's true that even among people who are students of the founding of the republic that I think probably most people are on West's end of this uh, spectrum. But Still, uh, it's a very influential way of thinking about American history, and um, it's a very interesting and influential way of thinking about political science. For myself, I still find it more appealing, persuasive than any alternative. And, uh, of course, there are a lot of people still who are sympathetic with it. So <laughs> we, can't, um, we can't decide that just because there are more people who are mistaken, we're going to uh, forsake the truth. That's very Jeffersonian <laughs> of you, right. Um, so why did federalism, uh, thinking now about federalism, um, by which I mean uh, limited federal power, deference to state states' rights, why did federalism matter so much to Jefferson? Well, it's a democratic principle. That is... He knew that although he, Thomas Jefferson, son of Peter Jefferson, the, the wealthiest man in Albemarle County, uh, could expect that when he reached the right age, he'd be elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses and, and then wouldn't be surprised that he found himself in the uh, Continental Congress and eventually in high federal office. For most people, if they were going to affect political decisions that shape their own lives – 
They weren't going to be able to expect to have national office. They weren't going to be able to expect to be governor of Virginia. So how might one see to it that such people would have the most practicable control over their own uh, community's decisions? And the answer was, well, decentralized authority. If within the federal system, the states were the locus of authority, and then within the states, counties, or what he called ward republics, what we would think of as precincts, uh, we're going to have the maximum feasible amount of authority, then the average Joe could have more say in decisions that affected his own life. That, so basically what it comes down to is federalism is a democratic principle. The alternative is to have a centralized body or centralized bodies, usually meeting in secret, trying uh, in many cases, to insulate their decision making from popular influence, um, be shaping people's political experience, people's social experience. And this was, he thought, the alternative to the principle that was supposed to have been vindicated by the American Revolution. So as Jefferson saw it, this was this just followed naturally from the respect for individuals that underlay the American Revolution. Right. Self-evident. Uh, so in chapter one of the book, uh, you actually have a quote that I think um, speaks to this idea that you're describing. Uh, you say, quote, predictably, he spoke as an American in his roles as secretary of state and president. On the other hand, he held that to arrive at the optimal political organization, Virginians must divide and subdivide. Their counties were not the smallest political unit he wanted, but instead he hoped to see them adopt the idea of ward republics. There, even common citizens might conduct their everyday civic affairs in company with their immediate neighbors. So this seems like uh, the principle of subsidiarity, the idea that power should ultimately be nested at the lowest levels possible or uh, by the least centralized competent authority. Um, is that what Jefferson was getting at? Is that what I'm reading here in Jefferson? And, and, and secondly, why have we gotten away from this model? Well, huh, let me take that second question up first. The reason we've gotten away from this model is that people f saw the opportunity to take us away from this model. So remember in Federalist 51, we have Jefferson's best friend and closest political ally, James Madison, explaining that there had to be checks and balances within the federal system because people would grab at all the authority they could get. And that's what's happened. People have grabbed at all the authority they could get. And essentially, at every juncture in American history, when it was possible for the central government to grab more authority, it did. And we end up with now an inertial situation in which we expect that many of the most important political and social decisions in our society will be made by a, com a committee of nine politically connected lawyers meeting in secret in Washington, right? So the, the Supreme Court, well, e even if you leave aside the courts, I think greatly distended role in our political structure today, we also have what would have been completely unacceptable to, to at least Jeffersonians at the time of the revolution, a huge bureaucracy of people who go into careers in government institutions that have been allowed since the New Deal, especially, but some since before then, to make their own decisions without any real oversight from anybody who's elected or anybody who's even responsible to anybody who's elected. So how did this happen? Well, it happened in the end because there were people, especially in the progressive movement, who thought uh, decision-making uh, body that was made up of a group of experts uh, given that um, respect for whatever arcane reason there might be, uh, was a preferable institution for making decisions to the general electorate. Now, I don't want to be understood as some kind of Pollyanna about the general electorate, but on the other hand, what's the alternative? And what we've, of course, got now is that many of our decisions in politics and in social life are made by people who are graduates of a couple of famous law schools and how do they end up being in federal courts well they were connected to some politician really so if you give people a poll in america um, they're going to say that one of the least respected 
bodies of people in, in America are attorneys. And then what could be even less respected? Well, let's cross attorneys with politicians. Right. And what do you end up with? Federal judges. <laughs> So um, it's not surprising that people often are outraged by decisions made by federal judges. Their uh, life experience, their social background aren't similar to that of a typical American. But we've ended up with this over time. Now, you might think, well, this is mainly a product of the 20th century. But actually, in retirement from 1809 to 1826, Jefferson saw the beginning of the tendency of the federal courts to grab at this kind of authority I've been talking about. And he lamented it loudly, repeatedly, in lengthy letters to other political actors he was encouraging to resist it. So um, this is not a new phenomenon. At one point he said that the fact that there was no mechanism in the federal constitution that allowed the elected branches to correct decisions of the Supreme Court was a solecism in politics. That was, <laughs> that was his phrase for it. So uh, there's nothing new about it. It's a huge flaw in our system. And then, again, the creation of the bureaucracies in the 20th century is another anti-Jeffersonian development. Yeah, and the problem with that is that, you know, when you don't have an opportunity to make uh, political decisions locally, you know, you take less uh, pride, you take less stock in your community, you, you know, with subsidiarity, when power is nested locally, you know who to petition for a redress of grievances, those in power over your life, you know, and those who make the rules that govern your, your community, you know them, right? They're, they're nearby, they know the community, they understand your community, they're forced to interact with their own constituents, right? Right. And actually, I think most Americans, virtually all Americans, have a feeling that, well, different states are markedly different. So if you live in California, you have a, a vague impression that, well, uh, Georgia is a lot different from California. Or if you live in Connecticut, you have the vague impression that, well, Texas is a lot different from Connecticut. I actually am an army brat, so I've lived in 12 states, D.C., in a foreign country. And I can tell you People in different parts of the United States, political societies in different parts of the United States really are markedly different. And Absolutely. people in Idaho would like a kind of libertarian government. People in Connecticut would like to be Sweden. People in Louisiana would like a government that, that takes conservative positions on social policies. The beauty of the Jeffersonian model of a federal system is each of those states could have what it wants. Right. People could be pleased, they could be satisfied by their own state governments. Right. But unfortunately, we've come to have a situation in which the federal government makes decisions that are outside what was supposed to be its ambit. And what this ends up meaning is that people in Idaho, Louisiana, and, Cal and Connecticut end up being dissatisfied, right? So we have this, this huge hysteria about presidential elections, which... In Jefferson's day, weren't even really that important. Right. His when his friend James Monroe was re-elected president in 1820, even in Virginia, virtually nobody voted. They had right. single-digit turnout in right. some counties. Right. And nobody cared who was going to be elected. Why? Because it didn't matter that right. much. <laughs> right. Right. It really shouldn't matter right. that much. So, on the other hand, now a presidential election goes by and people go out in the thousands into the streets and and weep and wail and I'll let the moon. Right, this yeah. is just this is symptomatic of yeah. the problem right? right now the ironic thing about that of course is that the people who have been most recently wailing are the ones who would can insist that we must continue to have a non-jeffersonian political structure well you get what you wished for good for you Right, and you would think that if, it, it, philosophically, if they're liberals, they would want to, as Jonah Goldberg puts it, keep America weird, right? They would want a drive across the United States of America to be really diverse and, and varied and interesting, and that's what you get when you have local communities being able to control their their, their own laws. And I think that, that it, it's kind of funny that, that, that liberals uh, want to complain about things like Brexit, but Brexit is a failure of subsidiarity. Uh, to, 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 to work. So. Well, I think uh, to some growing degree, it's no longer appropriate to use the word liberals to refer to the American no, that's political true. left. Well, they're true. not 
liberal. Many many of these people aren't liberal, and that's actually why they're unhappy. Um, right. But for people who are traditional liberals, the uh, the several different former top employees of President Clinton, for example, I've seen in media complaining about t- today's Democratic Party. Um, yes, what you're saying is true. They they <laughs> they like me um, would prefer local self-government. You know, when people heard the expression "no taxation without representation," that what they tend to think is the American Revolution was a tax quarrel, but what it really was about was. We don't want to. It's. It wasn't about not wanting to be taxed at all. It was about wanting to be taxed from Hartford, right? Uh, right not wanting right. to be taxed at all, but wanting to be taxed from what was then the capital, New York City or Charlestown. Right. You know, and people have the idea that well, these people just were anti-tax, but they actually weren't. Most of them weren't anti-government. They wanted local self-control. They wanted their local communities. They wanted colonial legislatures to have the ultimate political authority in their society. And so what we're saying here really is the classic American position. Yeah. The, the 20th century mutation that was foisted off upon us, especially by Woodrow Wilson, the, the worst of all presidents, um, contrary to what you hear in the media a lot nowadays. Definitely, definitely. Uh, that That is a, a kind of foreign imposition. Yeah, so in the book, you actually talk a little bit uh, about this. Um, talking about independence from Great Britain, you write, quote, Jefferson insisted vociferously that American colonists could not be subjected to an unaccountable legislature whose members they had not elected and with whom they had no influence at all. He called Parliament a, quote, body of men whom they never saw, in whom they never confided, and over whom they have no powers of punishment or removal. So this, quote, reminded me of the situation that we're in today with the administrative state where, and I'm sure you know all about this, where, you know, Congress draws up these vague statutory laws and then just sort of kicks these over to the executive branch with its, you know, vast bevy of administrative departments and unelected bureaucrats who then create a new set of laws, regulations that end up governing like our lives in the most important sense at at the immediate level. Um, you know, and even 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 Gorsuch recently said that, you know, vague laws invite the exercise of arbitrary power. And I wonder what you think of this. I was thinking about this the other day when I was reading George Will's book, the, the, his new book, The Conservative Sensibility. Um, you know, the the the, the conservative movement, um, you know, what do we do about the uh, administrative state? One of the points of Will's book is the idea that we have to rein in the administrative state. Where do we go from here? How do we tackle that problem? Because it seems like, um, as the founders knew, that the tendency is for the executive branch to grow. This is, it seems like the, the founders' greatest fear, what's happening right now with the administrative state. Well, actually, their chief expectation was that the Congress would grab more authority over time, know, not right? the executive branch. That's true. And so what's happened, again, was is that Congress has just handed off legislative authority to these administrative agencies. Well, they don't want to be held accountable, right? I'm- right, and you might think that if you read Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution, which says that the legislative p- power will be vested in the Congress of the United States, you might think that Congress didn't have authority to be creating other agencies to legislate along the lines that it has set down. And, and you know, and let, lest we skip past this, We've also seen in the last couple of years in particular, although this is a phenomenon that's been notable through my whole lifetime, I'm 56, that people in federal administrative agencies feel perfectly entitled in in private usually, but in public if they need to, to try to undermine the elected president, to, to try to thwart his policy initiatives, apparently to seed uh, hostile propaganda in the media which helps to show why it's supposed to be the case that people who are making our laws are elected and responsible. And that's, of course, a contrary, uh, that's an alternative uh, description to what we've seen, which is that people like Stroke and Page and Brennan and Comey and these people um, have their, their various ideas about the way that the government ought to work or even who ought to win elections and what we can do, we, the corporate body of federal functionaries, can do in case we don't like the 
benighted common citizenry's choices. So, wow. Um, it's all very Prussian sounding, I think. Yeah, I mean, it seems like what Congress does is they draw up, you know, vague statutes like, you know, we're going to fix the environment. And then they kick that up to the EPA. And then mm -hmm. these unelected bureaucrats whom we've never met, who we didn't elect, are making the laws that actually govern our lives in, in the most meaningful sense. And mm -hmm. it's like, oh, are we going to pass the RAINS Act? Like, how do we how do we deal with this? Can we have congressional oversight of these uh, administrative bodies when they make their laws? Should they have to submit them to, to Congress? How, how do we deal with this? How do we tackle this problem? Congress can limit this to any extent it likes. There's no reason why if there needs to be uh, some kind of environmental regulation, it can't take the form of a statute passed by Congress. There's no reason why, if there has to be a code of federal regulations, it can't be a product of the Congress. There's no reason why congressional committees with relevant jurisdiction can't oversee the internal workings of these agencies. There's no reason why these agencies can't just be um, advisory boards for right. congressional committees. Right. So in other words, there's no reason why we can't have this be regularized from a constitutional point of view so that it actually is the Congress that has the lawmaking authority. It's just that Congress has not wanted to do this. And you might ask yourself, what exactly is it that Congress does? What What is it in the last six months that the U.S. House of Representatives has produced? And the answer is, well, it's not substantial. It's it's not the important things. Occasionally, the the Congress will meet a kind of a deadline and will decide it has to uh, form, you know, produce a sausage that the president will sign. But it you wouldn't defend it. And in fact, nobody in the Congress would defend the entire product either. So this is highly uh, undesirable, really anti-Republican. And again, we don't want to avoid or ignore the fact that. Those career people I was referring to earlier do think that it's part of their mission to undermine the policy initiatives of the elected officials. Yeah. So if I had my way, the Congress would, over time, eliminate these agencies and itself get into the business of doing uh, what the administrative agencies are doing. So um, that's what, by the way, there should be federal judges who are responsible for deciding what these statutes mean, too, and what the regulations mean, not right. the federal bureaucrats. Right. Right. Absolutely. So so I'm almost done reading the conservative sensibility and it's got me thinking. I mean, I don't agree with everything Will says, obviously, but um, does the well, he's less conservative than he used to be, I think. It may be, may be. That's that's probably true. So um, when it comes to reading the Constitution, he's moved off in a in a, a libertarian direction. He's now in favor of what's called judicial engagement, right. which is you might recognize as an alternative to uh, original intent. Right? Judicial engagement envisions a kind of lawmaking authority for the judges that Will didn't approve of before. I I actually saw him right. discussing this recently. I, I I noticed this tr trend in his thinking for the last few years, but I saw him recently saying, "Well, you know, I was I was a friend of Justice Scalia, and Judge Bork was a really good friend of mine, but I don't agree with them anymore." And I thought, "Well, the book's called The Conservative Sensibility. How do you think that moving in a libertarian direction away from Judge Bork, who was more or less a Jeffersonian when it came to the federalism question, uh, how do you think that that's conservative?" But nobody's actually pushed him on that question. Right, right. So uh, I, I emailed him to try to get him on, but he is way too busy, uh, you know, for my show. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask about the Republican Party. Do you think that right now the Republican Party cares about the founding philosophy? Um, you know, do do conservatives in power care about the founding philosophy, or do you think that the conservative movement is? fading away in favor of a more nationalist, populist philosophy, like sort of like European conservatism? And how do you feel about that? Hmm. Well, it's certainly true that the Bushes, Romney, McCain, now Trump, 
none of them has been what you'd think of as a Reagan, Goldwater, kind of a conservative. Uh, what I think distinguished Reagan and Goldwater from these more traditional Republicans I just named is that the two of them really were uh, devoted to this principle I've been discussing, this federalism principle. Um, so I, I want to say that it's not really new. I think, you know, sometimes you see the expression rhino and people use the term rhino to refer to people like Romney and McCain, but actually it was Goldwater and Reagan who were rhinos, right? Romney and McCain is what you get all the way back to 1860, 1856. Um, so no, I don't think it's, it's really that much of a change. Um, I think people still who are interested in this federalism principle and decentralized government, in other words, are going to be Republicans. Obviously, they're not going to be Democrats uh, in the current environment. So on the other hand, you do have the situation that, well, we have the administrative state. So if you're a politician, what are you going to devote your energy to? Are you going to devote your energy to trying to rein in the administrative state or or are you going to take for granted that it exists and then decide how you work within that um, environment? And I don't, I don't think that the fact that they accommodate the administrative state means they're endorsing it. I think it's just a reality. People, the, the electorate generally, Americans in general, need to become aware of this problem. I think they're generally not. Right. And then decide that they want to eliminate it. Right. Um, they want to rectify it, and they haven't done that. Politicians then are going to continue to uh, operate in the environment that the New Deal and and Woodrow Wilson uh, created. Right, right, and and I think this is a big debate right now in the conservative movement. There's been a big debate recently, you know, started by Sorab Amari and the sort of first things crowd, and on the other side, David French, the sort of classical liberal philosophy. Um, David French, as you know, is a writer at National Review. <clears throat> and I think this debate kind of reflects that the tension that we're seeing. David is a defender of that classical liberal American conservatism. And Amari is seems to be saying, no, liberalism isn't working. And you mentioned earlier the idea that well, do we abolish the administrative state or sort of do we use it? Do we take for granted that it exists and just, you know, use it to forward our ends, right? And I would argue that you have to destroy the ring, right? You you can't wield the ring of power. You have to throw it in the volcano and destroy the ring um, because, the, you know, working within the administrative state and trying to use it, well, Trump's president right now so that makes conservatives happy but he's not going to be uh eventually and you're going to have you know elizabeth warren uh using the ring of power well you're not really contradicting me i, I don't no. think i don't think for example you know take uh Rand paul um now i think he's a libertarian uh and i think he agrees with what we're saying and in fact i i've seen well, I know that at one of his campaign stops, the first time he ran for the Senate, he, he held up that book that Tom Woods and I wrote together and said, people need to read this. Nice. So uh, now he keeps it on the, in the bookshelf behind his desk in his Senate office, right? So I know, I know what his sensibilities are. On the other hand, this, this administrative state exists. So a politician in Washington has to act within that situation, right? It's not, it's not a question of, how would I behave if the federal government structure were what the Constitution says it ought to be? Um, my point is then that they're not philosophers, right? They're active political participants. And so it's got to be the populace in general that decides it doesn't want this situation. It, the same thing goes for other questions in federal politics, too, of course. If you have a totally insolvent, hundreds of trillions of dollars underfunded um, set of entitlement programs. How is a politician who thinks, well, this is immoral besides an impending fiscal disaster, how is he supposed to act? And the answer is, if an old lady in his district tells him, I didn't get my check on time, he's got to take care of that, right? Even if he doesn't like the program or even if he thinks it's immoral at root, right. it's, it's unsustainable. She needs her check. Right. So I don't hold it against them, but I right. do agree that 
not only is it a, a philosophically objectionable feature of our situation, but it's also just, it, as I said, it's going to be a disaster. It, right. The disaster is getting closer and closer. Yeah. So, so I just want to briefly discuss your book on another founder, James Madison. Madison uh, is known widely by even those who don't really know much about Madison as the father of the U.S. Constitution. Um, you wrote that an means entire... they haven't read my book. <laughs> That's right. Is this accurate? <laughs> um, obviously, you don't really think so. Um, how large did Madison loom in, uh, in his contributions to this document? Ah, uh, well, that's a different question from whether he should be called father of the Constitution. Right. You could say the most important person in creating the federal system was George Washington, without whose, um, without whose authority it never would have come into being. Interesting. On the other hand, you could say that the kind of ringmaster of the whole creating the Constitution scenario was Madison. He he was behind at every stage. He was behind. Uh, convening the meetings where steps toward creation of the Constitution took place, and he was the one who recruited Washington to attend the Philadelphia Convention, and you know, so he played an extremely important role in making it. On the other hand, what he called his favorite feature of his proposal for what the Constitution ought to be ended up not being in the Constitution. There were other what elements was that? of. Um, he wanted the federal Congress to have a veto over all state laws, and he said this is the most important thing that needs to be in this. It actually was his solution to uh, a set of problems he had identified in a document called Vices of the Political System of the United States, and uh, it, there ended up not being a federal veto over all state laws. So Madison wrote to his friend Jefferson soon after the Philadelphia Convention and said, well, he, you know, here's how we worked out apportionment of the two houses of Congress. Here's how we worked out the problems between the producing states and the carrying states. Uh, you know, but the fact that we didn't include the federal veto means even if we ratify this thing, it's going to fail within a few years. I mean, it's better than the articles, but not much. That was basically his attitude about it. And there are various other of what he thought were really important provisions that didn't end up being, didn't end up being included. So through the balance of his life, Whenever Madison was lauded as father of the Constitution or some such, he always said, oh, no, no, this was a product of many heads and many hands. And, and it wasn't just false modesty. He actually had not gotten what he wanted. Right, right. So in that interview I mentioned earlier with Dave Rubin, you made the probably controversial case that Madison's accomplishments have been generally overstated or exaggerated. Why do you think that well, that's is? That's what I just said. Well, well, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, so we usually view him as the the mastermind, the the brilliant, the brilliant, quiet uh, one. He didn't have the large, you know, Renaissance man personality of Jefferson, but secretly he was, uh, you know, constructed our American system of government. Um, why do you view him as generally kind of an, an overrated founder, if that's not too much? He was essential to creating the Constitution, but he was not the draftsman of the constitutional system. He, he again, uh, ended up being thwarted in what he thought were the most important of the proposals he made in the Philadelphia Convention. The other one was that he wanted both houses of Congress to be apportioned by population. And he repeatedly right. brought that up over, uh, in the whole span of the convention. And finally, in the last week of the convention, he brought this up again. And t the vote was 10 to, no, 10 to nothing. No, we're not going to change it to have both houses be apportioned by population. That he had warned small states that the big states would leave the convention without agreeing to anything and on and on. So mm. again, um, he didn't think that the Constitution was his baby and it wasn't. And I think that's the main story I tried to tell in James Madison and the Making of America, although he played a very important role mm especially in bringing the convention together and getting Washington to attend, which was essential. He didn't write the Constitution and, in fact, didn't even like it. Mm. Um, and, but on the other hand, you can say that he was the father of the Bill of Rights. The interesting thing about that is that 
in his speech in the U.S. House of Representatives introducing the 12, the proposal that ended up being 12 amendments that were referred to, to the states for their ratification, Madison said, well, the reason I'm proposing these amendments is that there are many men who would otherwise be well disposed toward this system who aren't because it lacks a bill of rights. And he said, I don't think they can hurt anything. They're not going to do any good, true, but they're not going to hurt anything. So that's why I'm making these proposals. So in other words, it is true that he's the chief draftsman of the Bill of Rights, but it's also true that he introduced them with a promise that they were just kind of a tub to the whale, as one famous article about this called them, right? They're just kind of for show. They're not really going to have any effect. So you, speaking of the Bill of Rights, I wanted to get your take on the, the kind of constitutional originalist that you are. I imagine that you would call yourself a constitutional originalist. Now, there are different types, as you know. There's, you know, intent originalism and textual originalism and public meaning originalism, which Randy Barnett argues for and, and things like that. Um, what what how would you say that we should look how view originalism? How should we read the Constitution? Well, guess what I'll say. Uh, guess? Uh, ooh, you mentioned intent originalism earlier. Are right. you an in intent originalist? Well, I'm, I can't say that I agree wholeheartedly with any of the major strains that are kind of floating around among the law professors these days. I agree with Jefferson. Jefferson said the Constitution should be understood as it was explained by its friends when it was depending before the people. So in other words, Jefferson thought that the Constitution ought to be read as the people could be inferred to have understood it because that's how it was explained to them. So, if, for example, if you go, as I have done in three of my books, to the Virginia Ratification Convention and see how the Virginia Federalists explained the Constitution when it was depending before the people, there I think you find the way the Constitution should be read. And in fact, the way it should be read is as creating this Jeffersonian system I was talking about. So, for example, in, in one of the most interesting speeches, I think the most important speech in the Virginia Ratification Convention, and people who are listening to this may not realize, at the time, Virginia had about a third of the country's white population, and it had provided a hugely disproportionate share of the political leadership and the military leadership of the country. It played this key role that we've just been discussing in writing the Constitution. Um, in the pivotal speech in the Virginia Ratification Convention, George Nicholas, who was one of the three main players in the Virginia Ratification Convention, said, if we agree to this Constitution, we are going to be one of 13 parties to a compact. This government will have the powers you intend to give it. If it should abuse the powers you are giving it, you can reclaim them, right? Now, you can reclaim them. Nowadays, we would describe that as a different, we would use a different word for that, which is seceding from the Union. Okay. So, okay. in other words, Virginia entered the Union on the understanding that it was a contract among 13 parties of which it was one, if you're familiar with American constitutional history, you know that in McCulloch versus Maryland, Chief Justice John Marshall ex described the Constitution as the act of one American people. Well, that's not how the Virginians were told they were entering into this union. They were told they were going to be thir one of 13 parties to a compact, that their stated understanding would be binding on the others, and in case the powers they were granting were abused by the federal government, they could reclaim them. And that's another way of saying they could pull out of the union mm -hmm. if the mm -hmm. federal government abused the powers it was being granted. Right. I have written a journal article about this. I've written in multiple books about this. Um, people uh, tend to ignore it. But actually, this is the key factor in American constitutional history, at least all the way up through the Civil War. The Virginians entered the Union on the understanding that it would have limited enumerated powers and that they could secede if they were abused. So uh, the, if you're a Jeffersonian, if you read the Constitution the way that Jefferson did, 
I don't think there's any other way you can understand the Virginia Ratification Convention. Right. That's and, in the Declaration and, of Independence, too. Exactly. It is. But people like West would say, well, no, it was actually one American people. And the, the Declaration of Independence is important only insofar as it says that all men are created equal. And so all men are created equal within this national structure that was created by ratifying the Constitution. Well, that's completely contrary to what the Virginians were told they were doing in the Ratification Convention in 1788 in Richmond. So so this is how I understand the Constitution. It was the party, uh, it was the product of 13 parties to a compact. Other parties later were allowed to join in the compact, uh, but the central government was given only enumerated powers. And you repeatedly in the antebellum period would have uh, flashes of conflict between the federal government and states. As states said, for example, in 1797, 1798, uh, that 1799, 1800, 1801, that uh, the federal government is exercising more power than we intended to give it. And so this, this is, of course, contrary to the model that Woodrow Wilson gave us in the 20th century, which he said was an alternative to the Constitution. So we shouldn't understand that our current situation is some different feasible interpretation of the Constitution, it was sold by its progenitor, Woodrow Wilson, as an alternative to what he described as an outmoded system. Yeah, and I have friends, I've, I've been having this debate with colleagues and friends, and the typical argument that I get is, why should we allow these, you know, 18th century, um, you know, you know, aristocratic white guys, um, why should they be dictating, um, you know, our laws and our rights and things like that uh, from on high from their graves? And um, shouldn't we have a living constitution? And my argument has been that is not how it works. I, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the case I've been making to my colleagues is that, look, the, the the constitution does not have anything to do with the founders' identities, right? It is a it is, first of all, a, a, a separation of powers, and it's a set of negative natural rights, our rights from being messed with by d domestic threats, foreign threats, the federal government itself, our, fe our fellow man. It is a set of, of inalienable rights, and those principles are eternal. They're informed by natural law theory. So what are you talking about? It's, it's like fluid, and this is like the law of nature, or nature's God, however you want to look at it. It doesn't have anything to do with Jefferson or what he did to Sally Hemings or whatever. It, that, that's the case that I make. <laughs> well, I like the idea that a living constitution is one that has no effect on us, right? So that sounds like dead to me. But <laughs> somehow they've, they've used this term living constitution to mean a constitution that has no ongoing effect. Right. What? what? How did that come to be? It's right. really amazing. It's it's Orwellian, um, right? Of course, it's popular nowadays to to knock people who lived in the past because they, if they were in the United States, they tended to be white. What what does that have to do with anything? So these people are race obsessed, first of all, and then they they characteristically use terminology that gives the opposite impression from what they're actually saying. Uh, I don't even know how to respond. You know, it's obviously fallacious. It's it's almost facetious, I think. And what they're really saying is they don't like the idea that if they're in the majority, they can't do whatever they want, which, of course, all the way back to Plato, we've seen people making facetious arguments for being able to do whatever they wanted to do. But it's not preferable to a Republican system. And, you know, that's why they won't just be straightforward about it, right? We don't like having a Republican system of limited government. We want to be able to do whatever we want to you. And, uh, of course, the other thing is that they contemplate always being in the majority themselves, which, as we've seen and we discussed earlier, um, happens not to be the case. Right. So uh, another point to make in this connection is, you know, it's not only the Constitution that's old, and if you want to say that legal uh, enactments that are old should no longer be enforced, it's not only the only it's not the only one that would be implicated. So, for example, our rape statutes are all old, right? Our theft statutes are old. The prohibition on arson comes from 
dead white guys, right? right. Uh, do you want to say that that all of our other criminal laws, for example, all of our social conventions, the idea that I should, uh, if I disagree with you, I should just listen instead of assaulting you, right? That that comes from dead white guys too. Um, they can't really mean what they're saying. I, I don't take probably, it very seriously. Probably not, but it seems like they not <laughs> only are opposed to some of the negative rights, you know, freedom from being messed with, uh, freedom, you know, free, you have the you have the freedom to enter the free market and purchase a firearm. That's a negative right because you use that firearm to protect your own uh, natural liberties. Um, but they but they seem to. It's not that they don't like the rape rape statutes. They seem to want to add all these positive rights in there as well like 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 sure. inf- sort of inventing uh whole cloth uh these these rights like a right to health care right now suddenly um you have a right the state has the obligation to 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 not allow you to die from natural causes right like suddenly you know the the it, universal you have a right to ki- kindergarten you have a right to the services of a of a of a doctor you have a right to you know ha- affordable housing which means that the the construction worker is your slave and so they just want to just invent these positive rights and i and i say to my colleagues and and my friends declaring things rights doesn't just make them naturally appear right, right. like like south africa has it in their constitution that healthcare is a right that everyone has right and the universal dec- but south africa doesn't have a working healthcare system you can't just say that you have a right to things and just because because rights aren't objects, right? Rights aren't goods and services and commodities. I can't get this through anyone's skull. I feel like, the, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the lone classical liberal in a scene. Well, you're not the story. only one. You're not the only one. But actually, my favorite one is a Monty Python fan. My favorite one is um, we're speaking in the immediate aftermath of the first Democratic candidates debate in the 2020 presidential election cycle and we actually had a an invocation of monty python last night because you if you recall monty python in the life of brian there's a a discussion among the members of the judean people's front of the idea or the question whether stan has a right to have a baby <laughs> and one of the candidates William Castro the, uh, said this yes he well, now we know that stan does have a right to have a baby that's going to be vindicated by the Democratic Party. But, of course, the problem is that Stan can't have a baby, <laughs> right? So right. the fact that you declare something a right, uh, which was seen as farcical when Monty Python and the Life of Brian was made, but now it seems as a serious bone of contention in our federal politics, um, that gets right to what you're talking about. Of course, <sighs> What, what the constitutional system takes as rights are things that have to do with the integrity of your physical self, right? Your Lockean self, your right to your person and your other property, right? right. Your right to the things you can make right. or earn and your body, Absolutely. Um, your personal liberty, your, your uh, locomotion, at your own will, right. as long as you don't impinge on somebody else's property. That's right? right. So Stan having a right to have a baby, even if Stan were able to do that, is irrelevant to the kinds of questions that are actually implicated by the word rights. Right. Uh, if it were possible for Stan to have a baby, which it isn't, <laughs> he would have the right not to have that pregnancy terminated arbitrarily by the state. <laughs> I suppose he would. I suppose uh, he would. So, so uh, who are to... those dead white guys to say that Stan didn't have a right <laughs> I to know, have a baby? Right? Right. This is why we should lament their legacy, right? That none of them ever realized that Stan should be vindicated in his claims. How dare they defend the laws of nature? Um, so, so <laughs> Take them for granted. <laughs> So just two more questions. Um, John Locke, one of my favorite philosophers and a, and a champion of liberty, I, I think of him as the first sort of libertarian um, conservative type. Um, how much of our founding philosophy, uh, I mean, we could think about the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the Federalist Papers. How much of our founding philosoph- philosophy do we owe to Locke's natural rights theory, um, specifically his second treatise of government, his letter concerning toleration? Um, uh, how, how large does Locke loom in the, in the, in the founding philosophy? Boy, well, 
I mean, were the founding fathers reading? Were they all reading Locke? I mean, did, did Locke write our constitution, figuratively speaking? Right? Is it does it all emanate from from this sort of natural rights theory, state of nature theory, uh, and all of this? Well, I I don't want to say, of course, that it didn't have a, a profound effect. <laughs> However, we shouldn't see it as the sole source of the way that people thought about politics. In general, what the American Revolution was an attempt to vindicate was the status quo in North America. And the status quo in North America was based on the English common law. So people came from mainly from the United Kingdom to North America and established these 13 colonies. Actually, of course, New York was conquered from the Dutch, but... The other 12 colonies were established by Englishmen, and without thinking about it, in general, they transplanted English law to North America. Now, in New England, people transplanted their, except for Rhode Island, they transplanted their Calvinist communities to North America, so you have a totally different different demography in New England. In the, in the other colonies, the initial populations were overwhelmingly male, but New Englanders transplanted their family units directly to the North American uh, situation. So they did this. They brought their religious communities. They brought their English common law. If they were thinking about making social compacts, um, that came much later. So even in the initial Virginia scenario, which is, of course, the one that ultimately ends up producing Jefferson and Madison right. and these people, that it's not that they found themselves in a state of nature and then they decided we need to sign a social compact and set up a general court. No, they uh, found themselves in North America, decided they needed to have legislatures, said they were going to import the entirety of the common law. And where you end up with somebody like Jefferson saying, well, I'm under the influence of John Locke. And in fact, famously, he, in the entryway to Monticello, put... Uh, oil paintings of the three men he called My Holy Trinity, uh, Locke, uh, Newton, and Bacon, right? There are oil paintings of them right there on the walls. Jefferson, for one, certainly did think of government as properly understood in a Lockean sense, but he too thought that the common law was the foundation of Virginia's law. So, in other words, if we're going to create new states, yes, we should um, understand them in a Lockean sense, but there never was actually a moment when everybody was polled on the question, do we want to have a Lockean community here? Right. Uh, in the, a summary view of the rights of British America, which you mentioned earlier, Jefferson did uh, create a, a, a fantastic Lockean situation in, in the first settlement and say that all of these different communities were Lockean communities, all the immigrants from the United Kingdom had come to North America by f exercising their rights to emigrate, and then they entered into social compacts. And then, of course, that did, the, the one major flaw of this claim is that it didn't actually happen. So, or as Notzik would say, they formed you know protective associations because, as Madison puts it, you know. Uh, in a state of nature, you have natural rights, but they won't be respected because stronger factions can overcome you or whatever. Right. So, well, that's Lock. That's what Locke says. Yeah. But my point is that Jefferson, yes, does claim in a summary view of the rights of British America that the, the colonists came to North America in exercises of their natural right to emigrate, and when they did so, they eventually decided, well, we want the kings of England to be our kings in North America, and that's how he ended up with this defeasible right to be the king of Virginia or the <laughs> king of New Jersey or whatever. But the, the, the only obvious weakness of this claim is that it didn't actually happen. So, you know, that there is that problem. Um, but, yes, it's true that in general, people thought, well, the Lockean understanding of government should shape the way we think about our governments. And then the Lockean understanding of proper authority should shape the way we understand the federal 
structure we're creating by creating the U.S. Union, right? The federal constitution. Yeah. So in other words, Montesquieu although I, too don't, there. Yeah. I don't think we want to understand this as an entirely Lockean operation, certainly Lockean thought had an influence in the way people were saying we should read the scenario, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. There never was the actual state of nature with people in the boats in the Atlantic with <laughs> right. no law, right? Right, that didn't right, happen. right, right. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, so that actually is, that goes against what some theorists have said. I think it was actually Jonah Goldberg said that we were in an original state of nature uh, when we, when you know, we first got here, uh, arrived at the well, American That's what Jefferson shores. said in a summary review of the rights of British America, right? So that's a, that's a, that that's we entered a society. We, make. we entered society. Yeah, that, so if you're a, if you're a political philosopher, you can make that claim. But if you're a historian, you're going to notice, except that it didn't really happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so lastly, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, I'm, I'm actually a high school English and philosophy teacher at an advanced charter school, so I'm always thinking about this uh, for my students. For young listeners, I wonder if you could recommend some great books that you think young people need to read today. Um, so this could be on the topic of liberty, or it could be even classics that transmit important um, like works of fiction or whatever that that transmit important stories or ideas. Um, what are some of the books that that you would recommend uh, that young people read today? Well, of course, it's very egotistical sounding, but <laughs> I I hope they'll read Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary. If you have a taste for Thomas Jefferson, there is a fabulous book of his writing. It's the Library of America edition. The book is just entitled Thomas Jefferson, colon, Writings. So that has everything you need. If, uh, if your appetite for Jefferson's writing is not bottomless, you can get that book and just skip his own book, Notes on the State of Virginia, which is included in its entirety in that volume, mm-hmm. right? And, of course, you'd want to get Locke's second treatise on civil government, uh, that goes almost without saying. There's also a Library of America edition of James Madison writings that includes all of Jefferson's. Uh, I'm sorry, all of Madison's entries in the Federalist Papers, plus um, Vices of the Political System of the United States, which I mentioned before. Some of Madison's chief speeches in the Philadelphia Convention, where the Constitution was written, that's very important. And then. Uh, there's a really outstanding historian named Forrest MacDonald who wrote a book called Novus Ordo Seclorum, N-O-V-U-S-O-R-D-O-S-E-C-L-O-R-U-M. It's about the creation of the federal constitution. I think it's the best book on that subject, um, of course, leaving aside James Madison, The Making of America. Um, it's a really outstanding book on that subject. So <laughs> that... Uh, that would be a very busy summer for an ambitious high school student. Great. So yeah, so pick up Dr. Gutsman's book, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Revolutionary. I want to thank you so much for being on the program. This was great, really enlightening. Um, I really appreciate it. And I hope you'll consider one day coming back. I was happy to do it. Thank you. Bye-bye.